Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us as, uh, in, at this Ask the Expert session. As you guys know, I hope you enjoyed our Zero Trust the Road Ahead session um, with our top experts from, uh, from their respective field, Alex Weinert and Shined. So the purpose of this session is basically giving you a one-on-one -on -one experience with those experts and ask as many questions as you guys can. So there are folks logging in from different geos. So this is a huge opportunity. Don't be shy. Just ask any questions that you have in mind. So uh, before we can start talking about you know the questions and getting into the thing, I just have to give you some housekeeping rules. Like how can you en engage with the experts? just use chat to ask questions uh, because we have such a big audience, so many people attending. So the chat is the best way to feed in your questions. I will see the questions and then, you know, I will ask those to the respective experts. If there are, if there are questions that, you know, that has been asked and we did not get to it yet, you can up your favorite question that increases the chances. So if there is a question you definitely want it to be answered, use the upward signs. Vacant experts will answer all the questions verbally or chat uh, as determined by the moderator. One thing I will tell you one more good news here. Not only I have two experts on camera, but I also have a bunch of really good experts across different teams off camera supporting this session as well. So bring out any burning question that you have. Um, Microsoft Code of Conduct, you guys are all, we are all very, you know, very professional. I just want to make sure that, you know, we respect each other, uh, we respect each other's uh, dignity and just ask the questions in the most appropriate manner. Um, so this session can be recorded, um, um, you know, uh, so don't worry about it. If there are any questions, just ask and adhere to Microsoft Code of Conduct. Um, with that, let me uh, introduce you to our expert, Alex Weiner, the man behind our identity security at Microsoft, and Shanet O'Donovan, the powerhouse behind our Azure networking. So with that, let me transfer you to Alex. Alex, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Alex Weiner. I'm the uh, director of identity security at Microsoft. Um, I've been here for ever, <laughs> 25 years this week. Um, at Microsoft, and uh, if you use any service that Microsoft provides, whether that's you know Xbox or uh, Azure or whatever, when you log into that service, our team is the one that tries to keep you from you know having other people log in on your behalf. So we try to keep accounts from getting hacked. That's kind of what we're all about. And I'm also one of the uh, sort of people who cares a lot about zero trust at Microsoft and uh, works a bunch on it. Thank you, Alex. Shaded, I know we have been having a lot of technical difficulties, so I would love if you can introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Yes, I had a, a, a little bit of a panic just before we started. I had to reboot my machine, but I'm here. Um, so um, I'm really delighted to be here this evening. Um, I work in Azure Networking. I lead our network security investments in Azure Networking as well as our CDN investments, and I'm super passionate about zero trust, and I really like it as a reference model that we can all use to make both our products better and make our customers more secure. So delighted to be here and welcome your questions. Perfect. So looks like you guys are popular. I'm already getting tons and tons of questions. So uh, now this is a really good question and I will ask. Um, so Alex, can you move a little bit on this side? Your face is cutting off. Perfect. <laughs> no, no, a little bit. That's good. Um, OK, this is a question that I would say both of you can take turn by turn. Uh, the question is, what is keeping you up at night these days when thinking about security? Sinead, do you want to kick that one off? Um, sure, I'm happy to. Um, uh, I think we've seen um, a continued change of behavior. I think the, the bad um, actors, they just get worse and worse and more sophisticated. Um, and so 
I, I, I definitely worry about us keeping ahead. And if I just use an, uh, the COVID example, um, the recent example, we in DDoS, for example, we we saw like 50% increase in DDoS attacks. And and they, they seem to be, they, they're varying in type and, and, and course. So I would say it's, it's really about, um, it, 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 I worry about them get becoming more sophisticated, and then I worry also that um, customers are overwhelmed with all of the security choices that they can make to protect themselves. And how do we keep it simple? So, because sometimes it's just doing the basics really, really well that help them that help a customer ultimately be protected. Um, Alex, do you want to add to that? Yeah. So I think for me, there's a couple of different things. The the thing that springs to mind is. You know, to a large extent, the thing that I worry about the most is just adoption of good practices now. And I think there's a lot of reasons. You know, there's, uh, you know, technical debt and there are nervous, uh, you know, business teams and there's lots of good, you know, lots of reasons that there's friction in terms of rolling things out. But at the same time, we're looking at like, you know, 14% of our MAL actually carries a strong auth token or an MFA token in a given month. I mean, that's a very low number considering the kinds of threats that we're facing. So I think adoption is a big thing. And I think we need to make adoption a lot easier. Um, things like security, security defaults, um, the new work that we've done in conditional access to get the you know, legacy auth turned off and, and the fact that um, our friends in the exchange and the Office 365 team in exchange online are turning off um, some of the old and secure protocols. Um, you know, all those things are are big steps forward, but I think helping folks, you know, secure score things like that that help folks move forward in terms of their security journey are are really a big focus for us. Another big focus is that um, as we do get that strong auth adoption and and better, you know, better support for securing pathways um, and you know having better insights into what the traffic should be, we see attackers getting a little bit more innovative in terms of things like. Um, OAuth consent phishing and and you know, token theft and that sort of thing. And so, I I you know I want to make sure that we invest to keep ahead of all of that. And so, one of the things that Sinead and I work work on along with our peers at Microsoft is really trying to figure out ways that we can use the assets that we have. You know, so we have a lot of insight when we look at all the fish mail that Office detects, when we look at all the endpoint malware that Defender detects, when we look at all the traffic you know, analysis that Sinead's team can do and all the identity analysis that my team can do, we can stitch that together, you know, we think to offer better protection. But it is always an arms race. You know, like the the thing is that, you know, we, you know, if, if our attackers don't succeed, they don't eat. Right. And so, you know, we we tend to be very uh, very serious about trying to stay one step ahead. And so I think that's the other thing. So I think, you know, helping you use what we've already done and then helping make sure that we move ahead. Those are the things that I think about a lot. Seems like you're awake most of the nights. <laughs> yeah, most nights. <laughs> and those um, are the things, some of the things I can talk about, but mostly I can't talk that's about. That's true. <laughs> okay, so we have tons of questions, and this is a really upvoted question. Um, kind of answered, but since I have you guys on camera, I would love your take as well. So the question is, remote access from non-company company assets has always been a challenge. Is the endpoint security managed? Is there already a key logger installed? What is the zero trust approach for access from endpoints that you do not manage? So, Shade, do you want to take first crack again, or I let you go first this time? All right. So, I think um, I think there's a couple of things here, and this is, I think, you know, one of these places where business policy really matters. So, how do I feel about people accessing this week's lunch menu? from an endpoint that's not managed. I, I'm actually pretty okay with that. If you want to read about our standards of business conduct or our, um, you know, our like hiring guidelines or whatever, I think those things, you know, I worry less about. If you want to look at our, you know, Azure configuration stuff, then I'd say, well, that's a little different, right? And so we sort of turn the dial, like at Microsoft, we turn the dial a lot between uh, the assets that are super secure they have to be really careful about you know going all the way up to the level of saying a saw and a strong credential are the only thing that will get you in and those those accounts and those devices can do nothing else all the way down to you know what you can just do that from your home machine and we don't really care because it's not something that we consider crown jewels so i think that that ends up being a really important part of your story like you're going to have users who are going to try to access your environment from devices or from networks that you're not comfortable with right and 
then the hard part becomes being willing to say no, right? But I think, you know, if you can lead from that business policy um, and then kind of work your way down to, okay, for this pathway, is it okay to say no? So if I were looking at an unmanaged device, which may have malware on it, which may have a keystroke logger on it, you know, then I want to make sure that I'm backed up with things like multi-factor auth because of the keystroke logger. I want to make sure, because by the way, a person can use a keystroke logger on a device, whether it's managed or unmanaged and type that password. So don't think that that keeps the password in. Nothing keeps the password in. Passwords are terrible. Passwords are terrible. Turn on MFA, right? So if you have MFA, now you've covered that part. Now, what about how does the data flow? Well, if you're using things like SharePoint limited access, now you can stop the data from flowing to that machine, right? Um, and so there's, and you know, things like MCAS where you can sort of limit the access. So I think it's about business policy first and then using tools to gate the experience down to what's appropriate second. And being willing to say no, ultimately, if it's a if it's a significant enough resource, then I think there's a point where you say, no, I need a managed device for that. Really good say. Um, there is an, another question, Alex, and this is for you, uh, probably. Um, can Zero Trust Framework extend to your on-prem assets as well, say homegrown or legacy apps, or is it just for your cloud environments? I think 100%. So the way that you, I think you should think of your on-prem or home, homegrown or legacy assets is that you have many nodes of compute in the world, right? Some of those nodes of compute are now hosted in AWS or GCP or in Azure, right? So the each, each of these, and some of them are on, you know, legacy, you know, iron that's running in a closet on your on your corporate campus, but they're all accessible on the internet. Right, and there, I mean, at, at some level, there's a wire that gets to them, and so when you look at um, managing these things, I think you want to manage them to the greatest extent possible in a single control point. Um, in for Azure AD, for example, you can use App Proxy to get access to your on-prem assets, right, and then you can you can model those exactly as though they're just like you know you got ServiceNow and Salesforce and Office 365 and that app that that you know fellow wrote over there back in 1972. The only issue is that those really old apps can be protocol difficult. So for authentication, they can be difficult. And so, you know, there's a tail that we're constantly chasing to try to get more and more apps included. So like header-based auth, we try to include, and you know, as we're going down that path, the, the, the thing is that if you have an app that is completely isolated, how do you protect that? And one model is to use, uh, you know, like virtual desktops. To, to limit access that way and, and then control the network pathway very tightly. Another way to do that is to have, um, you know, like RDP, right? But you you still want to say that that point of entry is is controlled and monitored, even if you're into that really weird legacy stuff. And, uh, Go ahead, I would Gina. just add to, to just what um, Alex has said. Um, in terms of the, we provide a number of network controls as well um, to enable you to secure your access. And so most customers, for example, um, will put a set of infrastructure controls in place to sort of have a, a defense in depth approach to how you're protecting the resource. Um, and so, for example, you can use your, uh, your combinations of your firewalls and your VPNs, as well as layers and, and also how you allow the app to be reached. Um, you can also set some of the routing controls so it's it's really not reachable. Um, so you, it's really, a, I, what I would say all up is you want to have a, a, a combination of checks and balances to protect the access um, and and you, you you don't want it to be so onerous that nobody will use it but likewise you do want to um, make sure that every part of the path you have a security mechanism in place to protect the the access very well said Shana. thank you so much now this is an interesting one alex this question is mostly for you um CA and the concept of zero trust is a cool goal, but is there a best practice way to start? Start with simple things with the with the most benefits. Is there some guidance to begin? You know, um, this is one of those. There's an old joke that says that you know a good question is a good question, but a great question is a good question for which I have a good answer. Um, so that's a great question because I think I have a good answer. Um, we've been working on some deployment guides. So depending on the area of focus, so you know, on where you are, um, if you go check out the, for example, the zero trust maturity model, 
or we have a zero trust, you know, networking deployment guide, identity deployment guide, device deployment guide. Those are all at aka.ms slash zero trust. Um, and you can kind of dig in there and that's a pretty good place to start. Um, I'm a fan for identity because I'm an identity geek. Um, there's a document called security steps that also kind of lays out a bunch of, you know, good patterns to start with in terms of setting up a zero trust environment. Thank you, Alex. And just to further add, uh, all there's an AKA link, as Alex mentioned, aka.ms slash ZTBlogs. And we have published the deployment guidance on identity, network, application, and devices so far. And we're also working to make to create this one hub for all the deployment guidance uh, to answer all the implementation related questions that you guys might have. OK, now. OK, this is a really good question for you, Shanad. Microsoft has started that they use split tunnel VPN as the part of their remote worker capabilities. How do you monitor data that is going straight to the Internet segments and not coming back to your on-prem tools for monitoring? Um, OK, let me uh, I, I think uh, in particular, um, we sort of look at there's two models for or two classes of applications that you may be connecting to. And for SaaS applications like Office 365 that are, you know, very, very sophisticated apps that are um, that they use um, the, the whole um, internet to connect with and is accessible from hundreds of pops all over the world, um, it really um, advocates for direct internet access being the best mechanism if you want to have the optimal user experience. And so and what the, um, Office 365 is saying, hey, we're a trusted SaaS app. We provide you all the native security controls that you need as part of the experience. It's part of our SaaS promise. And so I think in order to, so we sort of look at that as, I think there will be a set of apps that organizations will have where they're if they're SaaS and they're trusted then you want to um, have them opt them connected directly and then leverage the security controls that are part that are part of the application and that's what Microsoft does um, and it isn't it is it's really about that we provided the rich security controls but they're all provided by Microsoft in the best possible way that optimizes for the user experience and so that's why we sort of support this kind of split tunnel mode we don't do it for everything. We do it for only the applications that we trusted. And then the other um, access methods are we use the our, our usual controls um, to protect um, that, ac uh, that access. Thank you, Shanad. Um, Alex, you did mention you're an identity geek. Oh, seems like next question is an appropriate one. Um, can zero trust model extend to all my users? Um, I'm specifically talking not just employees, but partners, vendors, friends, and devices like printers, smart beds, conference rooms, etc. Is there a recommendation on that? Oh, I dig this question. This is so cool. Okay. Um, so we just, I think, at Ignite just announced the fact that we are now supporting conditional access controls for all your users. So we have a, a support for partner users and um, also for B2C environments. So one of the big things that happened is the conditional access for external identities. I think Joy Chick announced that yesterday. Um, and uh, so that's kind of a big deal uh, that we're really excited about. Um, and then as far as the device work, we're doing a ton of device work right now. Um, the, you know, obviously with accounts that are using normal user accounts, there's some protections you can do now, um, but we're rolling in a bunch of work and I, you know, we'll, we, we, we generally don't do timelines until we're super close or we're in preview, um, but we're doing work right now around uh, more device accounts and making big investments in the IoT side. Um, in the meantime, I think Sinead, I'm sure will have some strong opinions about some things you can do now using the networking technology to help protect those infrastructure investments. Um, it is it is a model. The zero trust model is one that extends. And, it, and as we said in the talk, it's really important to start thinking about how you extend that model into your infrastructure investments. 
Um, yeah, and I can just speak to a few of the infrastructure investments and, and we go through this in our um, deployment in the deployment guide as well. And what would the first thing we would sort of say is, hey, we really want you to set up the your infrastructure with using network segmentation. And so so as you think about your devices or your machines or your services, we also use in in Azure, we use um, service principle, which is another Azure AD um, uh, concept so that you can identify the, um, the resources and then we can leverage that as part of your um, your both your segmentation approach um, as well as um, um, how you might lay down um, encryption in the environment and also what um, what firewalling and technology or network security groups that you use then to protect the different boundaries within the environment and this is where then again if you're looking at how do I protect my PaaS access how do I protect my VMs how do I protect my serverless or my pods in Kubernetes and so we really have this sort of concept of how do you lay down the secure foundation and um, so that you can also embrace um, zero trust in the infrastructure and and um, be protected. Thank you, Shanad. Now, um, here's another question on where I want to start with you, Alex. How do I know that zero trust framework is right for my organization? Well, um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think the zero trust framework in some sense says that you care about who's accessing your stuff um, in one environment and what you're doing to control it, right? Um, and 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 then importantly, the zero trust framework says that that applies equally to assets that are on-prem and in cloud, and that you and here's the important part that you're not going to infer a bunch of trust from any one element, right? So I think that, you know, zero trust as a set of security principles is, is extraordinarily global in the current world. Like in a world where many people are working from home, you're not really in control of the network that they're on. You're not, you know, many people are using SaaS apps, so you're not really in control of the infrastructure that the app is running on, um, the pathway between your user, uh, the device they're on, and then the resource that they're going to, all of those things are are surrounded in some sense by attacker landscape, right? And so how do you know that the request you're dealing with is one that is valid? And the way you know it's valid is you check, you look at artifacts about the request, not just, you know, did this request come in from a certain network node or from a certain user, but both of those things. And, you know, not just is it on a device that I know, but, you know, rolling all those things together. So you think about this as like, I always think of this as a triangulation exercise. If I want to know where I am, looking at one point, you know, gives me a certain amount of accuracy. But once you know, think about like a GPS system, once you pick up like 12 satellites, you're very, very accurate. You want to be as triangulated as you can in knowing the nuance of the request. And then you want to think very hard about least privileged access because like lateral movement is the best friend of the attacker, right? The fact that I, if I get into one thing and I can move, you know, if I can get into account one, and then find in memory an NTLM hash that I can use to go to account two, and then you know move over to that device, and now from there I can access a, you know network number two. Like all of those lateral movement points are the things that go. You know we did a talk, I, I did a talk for a different conference, where we showed in 15 minutes going from a broken password to total domain control for an AD domain, and like that's all possible because if you you allow lateral movement. So least privilege access, whether that's a network, an identity a device, like thinking very hard about what does the business actually demand in terms of allowing you know, access and then constraining that as much as possible to break lateral movement. Um, those principles, I think, are really global in nature. And I would be, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine a, a world where you would say, I have assets that I don't really care who's coming in or where they're coming in from, and I'm, or I'm willing to completely trust, you know, just one element of my environment to give me all the security I need. That, that doesn't seem, I mean, it doesn't seem safe. So I think it's a very globally applicable principle. Nuper, you're, yeah. Uh, Shanette, would you like to add anything? Alex did touch on the networking aspect as well, but I know they are like two different, uh, seriously, many organizations have, actually most of the organization have literally two different departments operating that. So uh, is there anything uh, that you want to add from the networking ones there? 
No, no, I think uh, Alex actually said it really, really well. I think it's a pretty general purpose framework. And I think you can also see that there's sort of general industry momentum around the framework as well. I think we're not the only company that is using it as a, a good guideline. I think this is a case where I think the, you know, I think it was Forrester who initially started um, this kind of concept. And um, you, now you have even Gartner talking about it as well. And so I feel like it's a very good general reference model. Model. It's not recommending any one vendor. It's a fairly generic kind of overall approach that you can use. And, and we've just really um, adopted it as a, a good reference model for customers. And, and um, the, all the best practices that are part of it are very, I would say, um, pretty fairly uh, straightforward and, and good frameworks to, to work from. And, and I like the model that it's not about one control plane, by the way. It's not about identity. It's not about network. It's not about just data data or just about devices, it's really about the context and bringing all of the those controls together so that you can make um, smart access decisions and and really protect your um, resources and your data and your environment. Got it. Thank you, Shirad. So this is a really big question for Alex. Um, I am in government sector, so tech adoption is slow. We purchased EMS three years ago for Office 365. Our stale Azure AD environment required updates before we can implement MFA with conditional access. Just completed this past year. New security focused projects are hard to justify as it leads to additional control for end users. For an organization that is thinking of dropping EMS and focusing on Azure AD T1 features and then revisit EMS, would you say this is the right approach? What would you recommend? What's your value statement for your recommendation? Wow. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, obviously every organization is different. Um, I think that, you know, I, I, I would always come at this from a perspective of the way that you want to think about this is you're trying to protect data, right? Like we're all information technology for you know professionals, and so at, at the end of the day, mostly what we're trying to protect is is assets that are represented in zeros and ones um, somewhere. And the way that I think about this is that there's three things that um, that that are really really salient when you're thinking about protecting data. And the first is, should I allow the connection to happen at all? Right. right. So that's usually a function of um, you know something around the the sometimes the environment that the request is coming from like where is it coming during office hours or from a building that i know um you know that can be a part of it and then the other part of course is who's the requesting person who's the requesting entity so does that person still work for me um are they still in the role that they were in before are they you know if it's are they in a privileged role like are those things that i would allow so requesting access is the first thing so are we secure at the point of access and that's really you know, to a large extent, that both Sinead and I work very hard on that in, in from slightly different lenses. From the identity lens, it's like, am I authenticated? Am I strongly authenticated? Is there, you know, access management rules that allow me to get to that point? But that's not quite enough, right? Because even like anytime that we look at data as a user or a service, even a microservice is composing it, that data has to flow, right? It flows from the resource server somehow. It goes to a web server and then gets comes down to the browser or it goes to a rich client like Outlook, which then would, you know, for example, cache the mail. And so that data is now on a device, right? That device can be left in a, you know, in a car and broken, and stolen. It can be um, compromised by an attacker. Like there's lots of things that can happen. So the next question you have to ask about your data is am I secure on the device, right? So am I secure at access? Am I secure on the device? And the next thing you have is that somebody sticks a USB key in the drive and copies that data or emails it. And I try to send it to Sinead at Microsoft.com, but I accidentally send it to, you know, um, Sinead at Microsoft.com and, and I like fat fingered it and now the data is in the wrong place, right? So am I secure in transit, right? So is the data secure at access? Is it secure on the devices? Is it secure in transit? And those are kind of, I think of those as like the, the essentials of, of like, am I able to protect my assets as a company, right? And those assets are, that's exactly EMS. That's exactly what it is, right? So, you know, retreating, I think like to, I only care about the who. Unfortunately, it leaves you very exposed in some of these other areas. So, like, I'm a big fan of identity. I think you know identity is the control plane, and you know, um, but I wouldn't, I, I would not stop 
with that. And then I think that if we look at the, the rapid evolution of attackers, when you look at, you know, E3 versus E5, for example, the, like the, 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 the thing that you get um, as you kind of go up, you know, that stack is you get more insight into what the attackers are doing. And like one of the things that happens is, uh, I think Satya talked about in his, actually I know he talked about in his keynote, um, <laughs> some work that our team recently did, which actually doubled the capture rate on password spray. Like that was the work of a lot of people over a lot of time using a lot of data that, you know, like actually looks around the world at all the different organizations in the world that use Azure AD and then was able to actually pick up very nuanced signals from that, process it through a big machine learning system and say, okay, look, this is an attack. Like think about the assets you would have to bring to bear in your organization privately to try to match that effort. And then you think about what data do you have available to get that signal? And it just doesn't, it doesn't compare. And so I think that, you know, again, this is one of those questions. Now, if adoption is an issue, like your ability to use it, then I think that that's a conversation we would love to have a deeper conversation on that because if we're messing up in terms of making it easy to use and making it easy to get that value, we want to fix that. Um, so I, you know, I think personally, I mean, it's easy for me to say it from this lens, but I, I, I live in the world where, I, you know, a big chunk of my team, all they do is respond to customers that have been attacked and that need help. And, um, so I see that and I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't relax too much. <laughs> I wouldn't back off too much from that. Especially on those times, right? When everyone is working remotely. Well, every, um, and, and everybody's, everybody's working harder, including, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Our, our friends on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> so. so true. Uh, this is another one as an interesting one. And again, uh, this is an identity question for you, Alex. Um, I am the sole IT person for small mining company and have been interested in zero trust. We are a fair way off, but I'm working towards it. A recent management policy soon to take effect, uh, soon to take an effect is a ban on personal mobile cell phones. And as a most personal don't have the company phone, as most personal do, don't have the company phone, I have suggested it's going to create issue with MFA as most staff use their own device for this. Is it accurate to say that this policy creates a security risk? What's the next best option for identity verification? Well, I think, I mean, what makes this super tricky is that depending on where you are located, um, the governments get involved in like privacy and and personal device management and that sort of thing. And so that that can be a case where you know, there are there are places where, for example, you can't use anybody's personal device or personal information as part of their authentication or, or work experience. And that's very challenging, right? Because it, it puts the user into a place where they have to think about and manage something else. Um, if the question is, I can't use the personal phone and so I'm going to retreat to password is that okay I would say absolutely not like the you know passwords are the without exaggeration when we look at our um, compromise that we have in our in our system and I, I I'm aware of marketing's nervousness when I start talking about these things but when we look at the compromise rates in our system fully 40 percent is password spray that's like people using weak passwords and having no MFA Right. And then another 40% is fish, which is people having giving, you know, fish or replay, which is people reusing or disclosing their passwords and having no MFA. Right. And so if we take out, like, if we just, if we remove from the system all the places where MFA is not used, we would reduce compromise by 99.99%. And I'm not exaggerating. Like, we've done the data science on this. So, Basically, all of the compromise that happens in our system happens because people don't use some sort of second factor beyond the password, right? So you got to do something if you're serious about security. The question is, what can you do if you can't use any personal devices? So you get into Oath hardware tokens um, or phones, um, and then you get kind of into, you bottom out pretty quickly in, in today's world, right? Because, uh, or the other thing you can do is you can issue a company phone, but that's quite expensive. Right, so probably the cheapest option you get into is um, a Oath standard uh, hardware token, um, and it's not it's not cheap, but it's the cheapest option. Um, that's the kind of thing where somebody has a you know something on their keychain that has a six-digit code, and the company has to issue that to them. 
if they lose their keychain, you have to figure out how to reissue that to them. Like all those things are, are challenging. Um, so if you're in a jurisdiction where use of a personal phone is allowed or is allowed with user consent, I would look at this you know, question of like, hey, user, would you like to use your personal phone? Because most people don't want to carry that extra token, right? And then you, know, you go from there to, okay, I either can't or they don't want to, and then you need to issue something else. But the cost of a compromise to a business is, you know, like tens of millions of dollars. It's more than anything you're going to spend on tokens. So if you can't use the personal device, I would say issue a token. Um, and then FIDO tokens are, you know, the next generation. And so, uh, and they can be used in a fully passwordless state and they're much, you know, the usability is better. So I would just jump ahead and go to the full cryptographic strength of a FIDO token for nearly the same cost as a both token. Thank you, Alex. That was the last question. I know we are five minutes, 10 minutes over time, but thank you so much for joining us today. So Hope you fun. found this session helpful and go to aka.ms slash zero trust to learn more about Microsoft Perspective. Um, and, you know, we always welcome your questions. Uh, shoot us uh, with any questions that was not answered today or if you still have something burning. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a great rest of the day, night, morning, whatever is going on. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.